Hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, we'll be covering the past, present, and future of stream processing. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by two experts today. Uh, Kai Werner is a field CTO and technology evangelist at Confluent and brings his perspective on what he's seeing from the Kafka community out in the field. Richard Tibbetts is a pioneer of stream processing and brings a unique perspective to both the early days of streaming and the future challenges that go um, with the emerging world of streaming artificial intelligence. My name is Michael Benjamin, and I had the great pleasure of working with both Richard and Kai. Um, and now I'm working with a group uh, building a next generation stream processor called Time Plus. Um, this is a live webinar. Um, it is being recorded, as you probably heard. Um, so you can review it later. Feel free to share it with your friends. Uh, feel free to post questions. We will answer all of those at the end. And I'll go ahead and go into our agenda today. So the agenda is to start off with a bit of an intro to stream processing for folks who may not be familiar, um, to present an overall architecture of um, kind of what we're talking about here, to walk through a use case very quickly, um, just kind of align our thinking, and also to discuss kind of what we've seen and what is to come. So with that as kind of a, a beginning, I'll, I'll start off with kind of what's the landscape here, right? What are we talking about? Uh, we are in the data in motion space, um, also known as live data, as that compares to and complements big data. So we're looking at the ever accelerating flow of data. And the goal is to give the right people the right insights at the right time. Um, Kai, there's an architecture and thank you very much for joining us. I know that you just hopped off the plane, so it's awesome to have you with us. There's an architecture that I know you've presented in the field that connects people on one side to kind of data-driven actions on the other, like a digital nervous system. And I know this is not just about moving data from you know point A to point B, but truly extracting insights continuously from those data streams. And you said it best, um, a picture is worth a thousand words, especially when it's an architecture diagram. Um, Kai, if I move to the next slide, would you mind walking us through um, the architecture we have here and sort of setting the stage for the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. And I now use for five since I work at Confluent. And um, the fundamental pain point I see is that people still don't understand what data streams are, no matter which concrete technology you use. but do this apple and orange comparison and think about a message broker when they talk about kafka and uh kafka is the de facto standard for streaming right you can also talk about pulsar or any others that doesn't matter it's the same story and so um just to set the context for um discussion today about the past um future screen processing let's set concept here and in this picture you see this very well i always explain data streaming four different technical pillars. Number one, this is the obvious one many of you know, it's messaging, similarly to a message broker. So you can do real-time messaging in milliseconds from one to another uh, consumer. And this is great, right? And with Kafka and similar technologies, you can do this at extreme scale and you can do it for transactional workloads. So in the end, you can even combine both. So um, at Confluent, for example, we have customers that process 10 gigabyte per second with a single cluster. Um, but this is still just the messaging part. And uh, the second part, which is now the fundamental difference is the storage component. And this is why I like this picture so much to also explain it, um, because you see that the events are flowing through the system. So we think about an event-driven architecture, but here with a data stream platform, the events are also stored as long as you want to store them. And this is decided per business object, right? So this can be just a few hours for log data that you only process and aggregate, and then you send it into a data lake. But for transactional data or customer data, you can store it here for weeks, for months, or even for years, especially with enhanced technologies like tiered storage under the hood, similarly like a cloud native data lake. And with this, you truly decouple the systems from each other, no matter if they're real-time or batch or APIs. And the real world today is not everything real-time, and the future will not be only real-time. And so this unique combination of real-time messaging at scale, together with the event store for true decoupling and back pressure handling, this is really the core advantage why Kafka is so successful in the market. In addition to that, very short, um, you also get data integration capabilities. So with a message broker, the first thing you add is another ETL tool or ESB, right? Because you need to integrate with other systems that are not messaging. 
and um, it's built in here, but it's also in the same protocol. It's real time, it's scalable, it's reliable, it's guaranteed ordering, but also connecting to traditional systems like a mainframe or SAP ERP, and on the other side to your favorite cloud services like S3, Mongo Atlas, or Snowflake. And last but not least, and now this is the sweet spot, and I always explain this to our prospects and customers as the secret sauce, and I'm excited for this conversation here today, is stream processing. Because um, still, even with Kafka or similar tools, sending data from one system to another, well, it's great, right? And you can then um, store it in a batch data lake and do reports on that. But the real secret source is about continuously correlating and aggregating data from different data sources. And this is exactly what stream processing is. And uh, we will talk a lot about the history of that, where Richard, for example, right, had invented Streambase, one of the first great products. And today we talk more about often Kafka streams or Flink and then I think we will also hear about how this is related to something like time plus in the future. Um, but this now in summary is what data streaming is. Real-time messaging for an analytics and transactions, event store for true decoupling and for persistence even long-term, number three, data integration, and number four, stream processing. All of that in one industry pipeline or use case. And um, this is, I think, a good context so that we can talk no more about this big component for the data streaming related with stream processing. I mentioned earlier that digital nervous system, and you, you sketched it out perfectly here. The idea of saying any data that's out there should be made at least able to move so that it can move to a place where important decisions can be made. And of course, I my eyes obviously go over to the bottom right-hand corner there about AI ML, and I'd be curious to know, um, just kind of looking at this, and the, I mean, the, the promise of a digital nervous system goes back to late the late 90s, right? I mean, Bill Gates was writing about this sort of stuff, and it's interesting to see how it actually comes to fruition, especially now with the advances in the last year or two. Richard, do yeah. you have anything on, on just kind of the overall structure here about um, how AI could inform either the movement of data or mm -hmm. kind of the insights we could gather from mm -hmm. it? Yeah, absolutely. The I mean, these this picture, this style of sort of flow diagram, you know, data enters on the left, exits on the right more often than not, very consistent, very common, you know, over the last 20, 25 years. Um, I do think that AI and ML is bringing some new aspects to this. It used to be we really focused on uh, machine learning in the center of the diagram, where there was some streaming decision being made about, you know, fraud detection, stock trading, those sorts of things. Um, but increasingly with the rise of generative AI and these systems that are amenable to, to being prompted in real time, being given additional context in real time, there's really a need for them to have up-to-date information, for AI to have up-to-date information to work with. At the same time, there's a tension where you can't uh, overwhelm the current generation of systems with too much data. And so there's this combination of a need to bring the data to the AI in real time so that it has up-to-date information about, let's say, inventory, uh, but also a need to be reducing or uh, you know, correlating, bringing together the information, aggregating the information such that it's it's uh, digestible by the AI, where the AI is going to be working you know, a million times slower than the streaming network. So it's, it's really easy to overwhelm AI with too much, or current generation generative AI with too much data. Um, and so part of the streaming workload becomes not only getting that up-to-date information in place, but presenting it in a way that's understandable. I love that. It's funny because in the, in the old days, we'd have to align, I used to call it like the awareness threshold, right? Where it's like, if you wanted to make a decision minute by minute, or, you know, should I do it now or wait an hour? And that day, that data came to you on an hourly basis or on a daily basis, you couldn't do it, right? Because it's like, I don't know if I should wait. And you can't possibly know that because the data doesn't have that granularity. So it's that same problem happening to AI, where AI has to have that awareness threshold as well. And that kind of, I like your analogy of where, where does the intelligence live and where was it? Um, mm -hmm. And I think we'll get more into that in, in more depth. I, I will say just, I like the fraud detection example. Um, and I might, we, we touched on it a little bit, and I might just kind of drill in. The, the reason why is because um, that general pattern, use case pattern of finding adverse anomalies against a typical pattern set, it's in all the research papers. It's certainly got lots of uh, attention from marketing. It's a good place to start. And I've got a little slide deck I'll go through to kind of animate um, just a small example. It's an oldie, but I hope it's a goodie. So just really quickly, just as I hand wave, um, transactions you could easily potentially flag as as uh, fraudulent just simply by saying, well, if it's a large enough transaction, you know, if it's two standard deviations above my average, that looks a little bit suspicious. So we could start with that. 
Um, but obviously that's just not going to do an, a, enough for us and it's going to have a lot of false positives. So you have to have more dimensions to it, right? So like in my example here, I've got my distance from my house and I've got a whole bunch of these transactions. There are the gray circles. They're different sizes based on the size of my, my transaction. Um, and I've got my kind of you know, Gaussian distribution, my, my normal distribution there on the side to say, are these transactions happening close to me or where, where you'd expect or far away? And it kind of sets up this nice visual metaphor of a bow and arrow where you're saying, I want to pick a target. And when things are far outside of that, like this particular green transaction looks like it's still pretty good, maybe my local coffee shop. But when there's a large purchase and it's far outside my home, at the very least, we could say with two dimensions, that's something to look at. So that's kind of a very simplistic view into um, being able to look at data and, and see the, an anomaly. Now, streaming data tells a story. So I just added another transaction there to the screen, and I've got this idea of, of streaming data telling a story. And it truly kind of adds the period to the end of that sentence, right? Where that red dot looks like it might be something just visually. What does that mean, right? If I look at this from a flow of time, I could say, okay, well, that first transaction was green. That was at Logan Airport in Boston. That seems to be probably close to where I live. This other one is in Berlin, so that's far away, but it's over a seven hour time period. That could obviously just be me taking a flight. So if I add a bit of context to this, add dimensionality to it, increase the number of features that my, you know, back of the napkin analytics or me looking at this screen is doing, I can take all of those potential frauds and turn them into just regular transactions. But the way this is happening is by both applying a filter for, you know, a payment spike, what's a large uh, transaction, and a time window. The time window allows me to correlate events and detect true anomalies rather than um, false positives. In fact, it could help me reduce those false positives. So I just wanted to quickly kind of double click on uh, the fraud detection example. And um, I think it ties directly back into uh, some of what uh, Kai had presented. Uh, Kai, this is um, a stateless and stateful stream processing uh, example that I know is very, very close to your heart. Would you mind walking us through this one? Yeah, absolutely. Because in the end, it's explaining um, what you already discussed. And once again, a picture often shows more than a thousand words, right? Because what I can um, tell you is from our customers I talk to, um, it's really hard to understand stream processing if you don't come from this world, right? It's uh, not like Richard who built Streambase 20 plus years ago um, and, and all of us, right? Um, but most people think, still think in API calls and storing data addresses in a database or data lake. And now telling people that you can continuously process data, um, but being part of the technology, not by doing API calls all the time from the database. This is the fundamental shift here. And, um, for, and, and I always say in my conversations, real-time data beats slow data, right? And for, um, a fraud, for example, even if you detect it 10 seconds after the customer has left the taxi and you paid by credit cards, put it because they already left, right? So you need to continuously monitor these transactions, like you said in this airport example. Um, and here now are the two um, concrete examples for that. Um, and in the end, we talk about data streaming and events, right? So on the right side, you see these events coming into the streaming platform. In this case, we have the log events um, from the credit card payment, which I do one in Boston in your example, and the next one then in Berlin. Berlin, um, seven hours um, ahead. So the timestamp is in there, right? It's guaranteed ordering and one comes after the other. Even if it's from different interfaces, like one is from your Apple Pay and the next one is from your physical credit card. So that's all what you can then uh, take in here and take action. And the first example is the definitely more simple one on the right side is the stateless example where you take a single event but on that event, within maybe um, a, a timeline of 100 milliseconds, you detect an action. So you implement business logic, normal if it's Java code or SQL or whatever your stream processor allows you to give, right? But here you do a decision. And for example, in this case, the threshold, if this payment is more than $100, then you take more action and analyze all these events together with other events. Um, and this can even be context specific. Like for me, it's probably not for $10, right? Because I travel so much. I just arrived in London city here. And um, if they check me for every $10, it's too much checks, right? Um, but if my mom flies over even just to Berlin from Frankfurt, well, there maybe they do the $10 check, right? But this is a single event state and you process each event by itself. And in this example here, we are using um, Kafka streams with Java code for payment spikes. And now a um, much more advanced use case on the left side, where we don't take a look just at one event, 
but at many different events. And you can still define the business logic, but this is now where people struggle understanding that. Because now you can configure sliding windows where you, for example, continuously monitor the last 24 hours of payments from one customer. And even if it comes from many different data sources, from many different APIs, you can get all of that data into one context and continuously monitor that. And as a very simple business logic here, you could say, if this customer here um, spends more than $1,000 in five plus transactions within flowing con uh, 24 hours, then we send an alert and let's take a look at that or block the credit card or something like that. This is a stateful stream processing. And this is much more complex to implement from a tool perspective. And then it's even harder to implement for the end user if they want to have it reliable and scalable because this is all about memory, right? Um, and it's it's in the end, it looks easy from the tooling side because you just write SQL queries or you have a drag and drop tool. But under the hood, you will get the memory issue, performance, X, and all these things. That's where we can probably talk much more about today, too. Um, but with this, I think everybody has an overview about what stream processing means for stateless and stateful. And both are great capabilities. And this is once again the secret source because you can connect any data sources to that, no matter if it's coming from your Oracle database, from your ERP or CRM system, from your mainframe, or combined with high volume from your logs from the mobile app. And this all together can be used to take the right action in the right context. And real time data beats slow data. So very often the right context is now and not um, a minute later when the customer. Absolutely. That real time bait data meets slow data the the idea that and at the very least it's it's funny because real-time data has always been kind of relative to the need right where a business might need something in 100 milliseconds or might need it in 100 seconds it just depends upon when the action can can take place that um fraud detection or anomaly detection is kind of looking at how things normally are and how something might wander away from that we see that in manufacturing as well where if you're if you're wanting to manufacture a certain number of widgets per minute or per shift and things move off, what do you do about it? The part that I always thought was fascinating was the feedback loop, where you can, um, like an athlete, you can learn and you can train and you can become better. Because what's happening here, like for an example, right? You certainly with the fraud, um, you've got the case of, I want to detect something that is an adverse effect and I want to mitigate it. But if in the on the other hand, you're wanting to upsell, cross-sell somebody, you're actually trying to affect somebody's behavior. So you're you're trying to not only detect behavior, but affect it. And it's an interesting thing because, like, I know that you know, um, in this space, the you know next best action of recommending another thing when you go to Amazon and they say, "Oh, have you seen this?" Like that idea of on my app versus my phone versus my uh, laptop. How how do I uh, work? And and how can the system recognize which one is the best channel to send me an offer on for the best conversions? And without having that complete picture, it's just not possible. Architecturally, there's a gap. So I think it's it's always fascinating to see this because you you look at that sensing on the right hand side and the kind of stateful correlation of events on the left hand side and it's fascinating to see how the systems now allow us to do this. Um, I I think probably we could spend more time on this, but I I, I kind of want to go back to and I know actually very quickly. Uh, hi, I know you're going to be writing blogs about this, and um, we'll probably get a better idea of the state of the art. But I think before we kind of move forward, I think it would be interesting to roll back to the early days. Um, there was a stream of de uh, there was a dream of stream processing in the early days. Um, and if I go to kind of a timeline going back to the you know late 90s and early 2000s, this is where, um, Richard, you, you had kind of come in as a um, you had helped bring a first generation stream processor to the market. If you go back to the beginning, we called them query, uh, continuous query processors, CQs. So we had all these different CQs. And I'd love to hear your take on uh, the challenges that it took in those days to build a stream processor. Uh, what were the dragons that needed to be defeated? Certainly. <clears throat> it, was, it was definitely an interesting, it was definitely an interesting time. You know, we were largely coming from uh, the data research community, database infrastructure research. Um, and one of the things that's sort of worth recognizing about the time was this is before uh, the rise of cloud, the rise of Hadoop. There was a sense in the early 2000s that we were finished with databases, that you could do everything with either SQL Server or Oracle. Those were the only two databases anyone would ever need. 
Um, and there was some hostility to that in the research community. Uh, but at the same time, there was like a lack of clarity about which problems really needed new solutions, which needed new approaches. Continuous query processing was very attractive from a research perspective because it was big, wide open space that nobody quite sort of knew how to do. And so starting academically, there was this sort of focus on like, is this all about understanding the sort of transactional consistency? Is it all about being able to automatically repair problems in streams? There's sort of interesting things that happen with live streaming data. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of an explosion of different approaches to things, different ways of doing things with, you know, some consistency around the idea that these are a little bit like database tables, but they are continuously appended to that the analysis you can run on the queries you can run on them are a little bit like database queries, but they're continuously um, uh, invoked. At the same time, as academics, there wasn't as much of a, a sort of a strict need for um, specific applications. You know, there's sort of, we had all these different ideas around um, sensor networks, what we now call Internet of Things. There was a lot of uh, DARPA defense research funding around those sorts of domains. With Streambase, we were one of the first um, movers to go commercial with this kind of technology to go start looking for paying customers. Um, and one thing we found was that very quickly, the, the principal appetite at the time was in the financial services community. Um, so it was probably six months into the company that we realized that all of our early customers, the people who really deeply understood this stuff already, who built systems that really suffered from streaming data problems, were in those uh, in that world of financial services. And it was actually a really interesting world to spend a lot of time in, um, in part because there are inherently side effects. So you're not just building systems that can consume data um, and produce to sort of reduce or analyze data. You're actually taking actions. You're canceling transactions, making new transactions, you know, things along those lines. And so that introduced a huge demand that I really see persist through to this day around how to build, how to make these things reliable, how to make them fault tolerant. Um, in a way that's understandable to people so that when they when they break, people can diagnose what's gone wrong. Um, because we frequently had, you know, actual customer order flow for some of these large financial institutions flowing through the system. So if you dropped a couple of records on the floor, you know, that could be millions of dollars, at least millions of dollars you need to track down. You wouldn't necessarily right. have lost them, but you needed to figure out sort of what had gone wrong. Um, and so it's very interesting as you look at the sort of dragons to be defeated, you know, a big part of it was that question of how do you build out fault tolerance? Um, there was a joke in the early days of Streambase, you know, back to Streambase 1.0 of, you know, is the product actually better than a Perl script? Um, and, you know, you're sort of, sort of dating myself by saying Perl script. But, you know, the idea was you could build a Unix pipeline that just, you know, pipe data in, pipe data out. And, you know, Perl's not slow not too slow. Um, and so it was really that, that move towards uh, greater capabilities around fault tolerance um, and then relatedly around connectivity that allowed the product to become commercially viable, that ability to build something that works better and more reliably than, than you might expect. Um, at the same time, you know, again, sort of dating ourselves, there was uh, a real lack of consistency in how people were deploying software. You know, there were there were multi-billion dollar hedge funds who preferred Windows as their server platform. Um, you know, there were hardly anybody was in cloud, hardly anybody was virtualized in any way. So we were deploying all sorts of these sort of big iron systems. You know, I remember one client having to get like a hundred thousand dollar HP box with like a hundred CPUs in it. Um, and it took up eight eight U of rack space. You know, we used to have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But it had blinking lights, it had amazing blinking lights. Right? It had blinking lights, it had Ethernet cables. I mean, they wanted to put that thing in a data center in Manhattan, you know, right next to the exchange. So that 8U of rack space was like real money. Um, and so, you know, being able to get these things deployed was also, you know, had a bunch of a uh, bunch of challenging moving parts. Really, that speaks to the lack of consistency in, in the way people were deploying systems back then. So I'd say, you know, being able to handle fault tolerance and being able to handle some of the deployment you know, the inherent deployment over and that comes with that um, were big parts of the challenge in the early days. No, that's interesting. And I, we're going to talk more about fault tolerance as kind of 
there were some things that were known early on as being things that would always be a barrier, always cause friction. Mm -hmm. And then it's funny because the, the, the kind of, those are the academic type things. And then there's the common, just human things, right? You mentioned Pearl and people saying, well, this is my golden hammer. Why can't this all be nails? And it's, it's, right. it's true today, even, right? You've got people who are used to a certain tool or a certain language or a certain framework or tool set, yeah. and there might be something else out there, but they're just not really wanting to spin up that that particular yeah, pattern. and a very common pattern we also would run into is, um, especially in you know the finance domain, people were very focused on you know performance or latency sorts of numbers. Um, they were you know many of these were sort of C plus plus shops that had polished the you know polished everything perfectly. Were very pleased with with what they'd done, and we were suggesting they use you know a completely different substrate. And you know inherently it's going to be you know it's going to be uh, it's going to have costs associated with it. It's going to be more expensive in certain ways. Um, but a lot of the challenge was really in helping people understand the value of, you know, getting a more repeatable, faster time to market kind of environment, which is honestly, I feel today is still what we're helping people to understand is that building on top of a substrate like Confluent, building on top of, you know, established functioning infrastructure, it makes things go much quicker, you know, makes your deployments go more easily, it allows you to really focus on, on building the important parts of your application. Um, instead of focusing on the sort of feeds and speeds of things that, that yeah. people, you know, used to be used to be into. Yeah. And many people who, re who recognize that transition, but it, I, I think it's still a challenge today. It's funny because I was about to ask about some of the adoption, right, of, of yeah. stream processing in general. And is it slower or faster than you would expect it? And I think it may be, you may have answered that things are accelerating now that we have that common substrate. Yeah, I think it's been a combination of slower and faster. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's been interesting. When we first started out, we had this vision that it would be it would take off like web services. Um, and it's worth noting this is we were just coming off the Corba days. Web services made the, meant these things full of nasty XML. Um, and so, it, it, in some ways, it has taken off like web services. It's 2023, 2024, and like finally, you know, using uh, RESTful APIs mostly just works. Um, but it took a long time for us to shake out which parts of that needed to be preserved, you know, which parts of the web web services were worth keeping and which weren't. And I think stream processing has gone through a lot of the same uh, transitions where people had some early early protocols, early messaging infrastructure that were were difficult to use in, in various ways. And now we've seen, and it's been an interesting watching the sort of, there's been a couple of instances of, of apostasy that have really come into play. I remember circa, you know, 2013, 2012, 2013, I started telling some folks that Confluence, that Kafka was something to watch. And I had several people say, but it puts everything on disk. That can't possibly be a good idea. Like that's, that's heresy. Like there's no way that could possibly have anything ever works. So I was like, no, it's going to make the fault tolerance much easier for like 99% of people. No, 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 no. Um, and so it has been interesting watching those sort of transitions as people question some of the assumptions, like the assumption that everything has to be in memory and we just need to have magical amounts of redundancy. That's the only way we could possibly do business to realizing that no, like you can you can get really far putting some stuff on disk or putting the right things on disk. Uh, yeah. I hope I'm not selling Confluent short these days, Kai, but, but I, that was a big transition for me was realizing that we could have a messaging infrastructure that was it was a lot easier for people to administer. Yeah, and, and maybe to add to that, of course, and from a historic perspective, also um, the kind of architecture and deployments completely changed, right? I mean, thanks to Kubernetes, thanks to cloud and fully managed services. Um, at that time with Streambase, I guess, if you tell a bank that you deployed on a server and it might go down in a container, right? They would call you crazy, right? But um, um, today in the cloud, it's very normal that containers are go, uh, go down um, all the time, but you need to make sure um, that they don't, uh, even if they go down, that the system continues to operate. That's why replication distributed systems um simply the, the paradigm shift here is from an architecture perspective but what I is interesting if you look at this this journey here for 30 years is um there is still the difference between the end user who builds the applications and then the um, software provider or cloud provider because in the end as a user I don't care right at that time I bought Streambase and I did trading and today maybe I buy Confluent Cloud and I want to do um, a new core banking platform in the cloud still in the end I don't care I just use this API and use Java or a UI and in the end you as a, as a 
um, cloud provider or as a software vendor, you have to solve the problem under the hood. So um, at that time, um, I mean, even in, in 2022, in 22, um, I was a uh, university, right? But um, even 10 years later, when I was a Tipco and used Streambase, um, I didn't understand these things you just talked about under the hood from the end perspective, because I was just an end user. Um, and I think this is also the interesting part about this journey where this didn't change much. Um, now people use much more Kafka, right? Um, but uh, in the end, they are just the client side and the server side. This is what someone like Confluent or others need to make sure that it works and scales for the use cases. No, that's a great transition. And and um, I'll say we're going to go on to the next part about kind of some of the rules that were set early but have taken a long time to come to fruition. And it's funny to see these things that were sketched out even back in, in the early 2000s and how it still applies today. So, Richard, I'll just say really quickly, you were the CTO of Streambase, as we mentioned a couple of times, right after Michael Stonebreaker. And Stonebreaker wrote the eight requirements of stream processing, sort of in the style of COD's 12 rules. Yep. And uh, we don't have to, this is a bit of an eye test because it's a lot of text. Um, there are um, rules up here. I'm missing uh, an eighth one. Um, but that we have the, the seven rules up here. And um, I tried to put them into the ones that were solved that were addressed, but still a little bit prickly. We can kind of debate this and the ones that seemed to me to still be a challenge, right? The first one, obviously, keeping the data moving. I mean, we definitely have, uh, as you mentioned, kind of a common substrate now that a lot of people can rely on and also an ecosystem. There's other um, methods to have data in motion that Kai, you mentioned, plenty of places for that for um, handling stream imperfections where there's disorder, where an event comes late. Like in my example earlier, maybe the uh, knowledge of, hey, this is just a guy flying, uh, going on a, a plane ride, maybe that comes far late and they've been marked red for too long. So what do you do with that, right? So that seems to have been solved to a certain extent, though perhaps not. And then, you know, having data safety and availability and being able to scale up and scale down, partitioning, uh, a lot of these seems like they they have been uh, solved to a certain extent. The one that I'm kind of looking at, though, is the query using SQL on streams, because that one was close to, I think, all of our hearts, right? Where um, uh, certainly I might ask kind of, was that one of the bigger holy grails that we wanted to have early on? Yeah, I, I think that was the idea, the ideal was to insulate um, some of the upstream and downstream systems from the details of, of how these uh, how this infrastructure worked. Um, and so part of the idea of, of SQL or of some sort of structured query language uh, over streams was that uh, ability to sort of standardize, um, to help people be able to work with these things, you know, sort of more interactively, more dynamically, to be able to layer additional infrastructure on top of it. Um, I think on one in one way there has been success there. There's a lot of these systems that are are SQL uh, SQL inspired, SQL derived. Um, it becomes an easy way to combine historical and, and real time data. It, on the other hand, um, there's aspects where that that hasn't really come to pass. So you know, to the best of my knowledge, you know, none of the major uh, BI vendors, none of the major you know data visualization or analytics vendors have support for streaming or have support for streaming SQL. Um, there's some motion in that direction. I've talked to a couple of people who are trying to explore that space, but there's not yet a real standardization in that kind of downstream consumption. So I think there hasn't been as much of the standardization aspect, but there has been a, a focus on using that style, which allows people to learn these things and, and take their lessons, take, take what they learn from one to the next. Now, it's interesting you went for the app side. My mind was actually going on, on the, the system side, right? Where like Flink and KSQLDB and others, it's 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 not a bolt-on or anything, but it's it's certainly the case that it's um it they can be wily, right? Where if you if you you'll have to have some knowledge of the underlying engine and a little bit of cleverness might actually be required to really be able to make that use fully um right. from the system side. But you're right, it's kind of on both sides. It's uh we we did have, you know, the the Rumors of SQL's demise have been greatly exaggerated, and it kind of seems uh -huh. like the return of SQL, right? Where it's 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 definitely something that everybody wants to make use of, and now there's a lot more capabilities. Especially, we'll we'll get into this in a bit, but like the the next generation of stream processing tools out there that have said, you know, from the beginning we want to have SQL as a first class citizen, and what does that mean for us? You know, 
Yeah, maybe to add to that, um, what's also interesting for the audience, right? I mean, almost all these tools uh, from Simbase and Apam and IBM students and so on, they all were built on top of SQL, right? And then even if you had visual coding under the hood, it was um, SQL that was generated, right? The same now with KSQL or with um, Flink, all have different trade-offs and pros and cons. Um, but but um, the one thing what you said is completely right. So um, you need to understand it a bit. As I said also before about memory issues or performance issues, especially if it's stateful. Um, but on the other side, keep in mind, um, ask your favorite um, friends who are using um, Snowflake or similar tools, right? I mean, you also write SQL against it. Um, maybe it works and scales, but therefore you pay them a lot of money for these queries and you DBT it again and again, right? So there's um, um, SQL also for other technologies that are not streaming. Um, it always has pros and cons. It's not always that it just has pros. Um, this is also what I want to emphasize in a similar way, absolutely. Um, like um, these days for Flink SQL, it has a lot of advantages compared to KSQL, for example, regarding stateful processing scale, um, because it's a separate in engine exactly built for that. But still, um, even if it's just SQL, which is true, but still you need to understand um, what queries you write. And this is why I'm always saying, um, especially to new people, and, and most of our customers just use Kafka as a pipe today and learn screen processing with us. I tell them, hey, you can play around with that. It has a nice UI, it has some code completion. But please ask us from the beginning before you try out your use case to solve problems, because there's always 20 alternatives how to implement it. And we can guide you which five of them are successful, and the other ones either will cost a lot of money or they will not perform as you expected. And that's a great insight. And it's it's funny when I see rule six about partitioning and scaling, I kind of wonder if we could, you know, travel back in time and whisper into the ears of the authors of of this, kind of what things we could say to watch for or what things might help out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the challenge with partitioning and scaling has always really gone hand in hand with how do you articulate your um the, the applications constraints around reliability, around, you know, sort of delivery around state. Um, so, you know, the simplest systems are easy to partition and easy to scale. Uh, as soon as you start to have, you know, this sort of stateful work, um, then there may be a way to naively partition, but often there is not. Um, and then the, as you create more sophisticated partitionings, you often end up with multiple uh, replicas of some information or, or multiple things that need to be kept in sync in order for perfect operation. Um, and so as you uh, introduce more of the partitioning, more of the scaling, the you, you do have some design decisions to be made there or some 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 of these things come into play. Um, and I, I don't know that we yet know what the uh what the silver bullet is, what the mm. you know, what the the best solution is obviously you know key-based partitioning is a is a powerful tool that, that solves a lot of problems um but it's not enough and i don't know that we really know exactly what is enough today right yeah, and i think that what is enough and what still remains a challenge i mean these far right hand side of integrating you know the unifying data together right the concept of i've got streaming data i've got historical data and i want everything to happen instantaneously that's going to be something that i think we can kind of think about as as uh, as we move to the future. We do have about 25 minutes left. I'd like to jump into a little bit of kind of where things have moved in the last 30 years and um, have you all talk through this. I mean, so we mentioned Flink, we mentioned a few other uh, tools out there. And as I kind of look through this, it, it honestly, it feels to me like, you know, as the proliferation of streaming data kind of spikes up as we've seen, um, as as we start to see this, I kind of feel like we're just getting started. I mean, having done this for a while, it does even. I'm still like, man, everybody's getting into this, and it's kind of kind of a cool thing. I would be curious to know: do you, do you agree that it's kind of accelerating? And and Kai from the Confluent community, do you see more people getting into stream processing? Yeah. So so. I, I can start with this. So um, from, from the Confluent perspective or also from the broader Kafka and Flink um, um, community open source perspective, um, you're absolutely right, right? So this is just getting started. Um, even though um, it looks like we're sure that stream processing is decades old, right? And which it is, right? We have seen stream-based and financial services now for 20 plus years, but most enterprises are so early started. And um, because this is such a big paradigm shift, um, it's a step-by-step -step approach. So most customers already at a huge value if they just introduce Kafka um, to build pipelines at scale and with consistency across real-time and non-real-time data sets because 90% of their data sources and things are still not real-time, right? So this is the value of Kafka still. Um, but on top of that, the stream processing, this is in the next journey. And this is why um, 
we see more and more adoption these days and um, this will I'm 100% um, convinced in the next five to 10 years, this is where we really see the massive adoption across all industries. As part of that, there's two reasons I see. Um, number one is, and this is also what you see in this um, um, diagram here, is on the one side with open source and its mind, um, it's a di different paradigm how you build new innovative technology and everybody can contribute, everybody can use, um, no discussions in the university, right? Um, do I need a stream-based license or a Tama license or not, right? Um, it, it's all these things, it's open anyway, right? And you can do whatever you want with it. Um, because this is also hedge very a, a license where you can with that. Um, and, and that's the one trend I see. And then even if vendors like Confluent, of course, have a business model on top of that, um, but at its core, and it's the same for Confluent, our core is Kafka and Flick. And on top of that, we build products around cloud services and additional tools for governance and security, because that's what every enterprise needs anyway. And nobody wants to build it because they want to focus on business logic and fast time to market. So that's the one thing I see for the mass adoption of being processing. And the second one is clearly cloud. So um, in the cloud, the fundamental difference is that you can use um, fully managed or serverless offerings. And so you can focus on the business logic and have very fast time to market. And that, and it's also a bit different to when you did screen-based or a Palma um, 20 years ago. Um, it's elastic and scalable from the beginning, and you don't have to care about that. You just declare your applications, and it elastically scales for you up and also down. That's important and even harder to implement. But um, you can implement, for example, um, Christmas or Thanksgiving in retail out of the box, but you still just implement the business logic, and all the scale is handled for you, and you just consumption and of course over christmas you pay a little bit more right but therefore you also have 10x more revenue as a retailer and um, this is really the two adoption points which i see coming in the next five to ten years because it's so easy to use it still it's the broad community behind it and um, in a cloud service then you have still all these different options and this is i think is another trend i compared to um, 20 years ago like where you had unlike the stream you had one tool and you used it right and um not really another option. Today, um, it doesn't really matter much if you have a streaming platform where it's not a Kafka topic. If you use Kafka streams and deploy it in a Kafka container with Java, um, if you do something like um, a Flink, often as a fully managed service, or, um, either if it's then SQL or maybe Java, but you run it as a fully managed service, or you still use another third party which you love, right? Like maybe a Python framework for stream processing or another software as a service. So this is the decoupling of data streaming which enables screen processing for everyone, no matter what technology you want to choose. And no matter what's more the simple stream processing, right? Like Flink or Kafka streams, or maybe then, and it's probably what's also coming in the future is more these, what we call them the streaming databases, right? And then analytical databases and where probably time post then fits in, right? Um, but this is exactly why I see this mass adoption and it's not one technology that wins it all. It's many different technologies and cloud services. Um, and, and of course, the vendors then try to differentiate and, and provide the best services, but still, um, really, these different technologies are complementary to each other. And this is also part of what mass adoption really will come in the next year. So I'm 100% convinced. Yeah, it's it's funny because that combination, that one-two punch you're mentioning, the nitro and the glycerin of like open and cloud. I mean, the idea is that you can do whatever you want and you can not do whatever you don't. So if if you if you want to focus on the analytics, if you want to focus on like as an example on the far right hand side, time plus, right? If you wanted to go in there and write a query, this is going to see all the historical data and all the live data in one query. You can do it, but you don't have to worry about configuring all the infrastructure behind that because it's a cloud offering. Um, and I might just jump ahead to the, the next part. I want to get to the future and have a little bit of time for Q and A if we have any. Um, but here talking about kind of the evolution of of the stream processing ecosystem we, we did start out kind of early on with point solutions we've mentioned a lot of them in, uh with with the tools that are out there and they certainly became some vendor-based products where you know maybe you had something that was an order management system initially and then you had a system that could handle smart order routing and other analytics as well uh that might have become an open source framework or people saw what was being done and said dude i want to try that out so they went out and made their own we saw plenty of that. And then we kind of had this nice feedback loop, right? Where an open source framework might be built into a point solution, which would then be open sourced into a framework. And you had this kind of combination of, of things being built out. Eventually you get to this point where you've got these watering holes. People can go and spin up a, a Kafka system and they've got a messaging for them. In the old days, they might have to go, you know, call up a sales rep somewhere and have an SE come in and build it for them. So you got these ecosystems where you can build things out. Plus, you've got serverless cloud offerings, fully managed services. So again, it's that one-two punch of 
being able to focus on what you want to do and uh, unfocus on what you don't. <laughs> so, I mean, I I am I missing anything or is this, to me, this seems like a very rose-colored glasses, you know, the golden era of stream processing, but is there is there anything, is there any uh, snakes in the grass that I'm not looking for? So That's maybe good. I'm not sure. I'm it's good, right? But one thing what people often underestimate is still um, the power of having this choice. Even if you do, for example, Kafka or Flink, right? Kafka can be de facto standard as a protocol, right? So, and there is other vendors behind it now, right? Like Red Panda or Warp Stream, they also do the Kafka protocol or cloud services like the Microsoft Azure, it's also not Kafka under the hood. So they implemented their own engine but use the Kafka protocol. And with this then, um, you have different flexibility. Even if you um, don't use open source for good reasons anymore like you want a fully managed service but that's for example confluent cloud our idea is that you can deploy it everywhere and it's all the cloud providers in all regions and you can even link them together like doing disaster recovery between microsoft azure in uh, in us east and between um amazon and us west right and all these kind of things or integrate hybrid or edge and uh this flexibility because um and, and this is the important thing why it's still at its core open source the kafka protocol is always the same no matter if you use open source if you use another vendor or if you use one cloud product and that's why um it's also an interesting thing for us right because these migrations are seamless right no matter if customers want to migrate from self-operated kafka into confluent cloud or migrate away from um asia and hubs or amazon msk because it's a kafka protocol which is open and defined in a standard way um, this is really um, a, a great. And also, of course, the other way around. We, of course, don't want to see them. I never would expect that someone migrates off Confluent, right? But you could do it in the same way the other way around. If, for example, we charge the next morning to decide, well, um, no, um, I go back to open source. Um, so um, this thing, the important thing about this picture here with the combination of open source protocol and still providing the fully managed service and differentiating solutions from different vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. And I'll, I'll say just one last point on this. I mean, the... That there's a connect with confluent program that time plus happens to be a part of and we we're recognizing how the ecosystem is is benefiting people come to us with all kinds of fascinating problems which i i suppose kind of moves on to the next part about you know what is the future hold for stream processing right so we touched on this briefly um with that far right hand side of the challenges that still kind of exist um and it going back in time with what we know now and uh, I, I think this one-two punch from rule four, right? Where being able to have the integrated streaming and historical, uh, being able to have this unified uh, analytics approach, and then being able to respond instantaneously as things occur. Plus you can go back and uh, take all the lessons from that kind of deeper learning and that's instantaneously available to you because of the performance. When I, when I was actually, uh, some folks and I were talking about this at Time Plus and it kind of seems like you're merging together the the parts of the brain, the system one, system two, fast and slow thinking, where you've got the ability to have uh, real-time analytics, but if you need to, um, and of course, real-time analytics, it goes back to history, right? So I, I can go back as far as I want to, and I can instantaneously get back the answers that I need. Plus, I've got continuous awareness. So if I was to kind of summarize this, it's like a nerve that knows a lot. It's this knowing nerve concept. And I think that's a fascinating place to kind of take it into the future and to consider this when you think about um, artificial intelligence. And a lot of what we're doing with that is we're taking an intelligent model we have now and building an artificial analog to it. And this is a bit different because we don't have nerves that have an enormous amount of memory, that have an enormous amount of uh, embedded learning within them. So it's kind of a new model. It's almost instead of uh, artificial intelligence, this is like an alien intelligence, right? So just, it's kind of, it's easy to walk that through an example, right? Here's my example. If I'm off a target, whatever that target happens to be, and I was trying to make the analogy of a bow and arrow earlier, right? But I call it 2% in the last two minutes. What did I do the last 300 times? So as an example, if uh, I'm trading and I'm down 2% from my PNL, what did I do the last 300 times to get myself back up? And how could I get back into the green and make it a good day at the end of the day, right? So I want to finish my day well. And then what worked best in similar situations in the past? So I can kind of sense what's happening right now, get a model of that and say, go back to all the history you ever learned about and tell me what to do in the next bit. This, I think, is an interesting place because it's 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 deeply intelligent stream processing, that concept of deeply, uh, th these are deep streams we get to wander into. Richard, I'd be very curious to hear what you think about this. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think it's very compelling in, in a couple of ways. I mean, I think when you look at the future of stream processing, you know, we're still seeing a transition of organizations to having their data available in a streaming fashion. Um, you, know, you go back to, um, yeah, it, you know, I, there was a large retailer I worked with in 2012 um, that, had, that wanted to do a bunch of interesting real-time stuff that might have aligned with some of what you're describing here you know, in terms of real-time offers and things like that. But the reality was they didn't have the data in motion. Hmm. Fast forward to 2022, that same retailer has brought all of their inventory data online, has it, you know, sort of up-to-date, happens to have it available in Confluent. And so these systems have gotten much more buildable. So that's that's a huge part of what makes this uh, the future possible is the, you know, the standard, some of the standardization that, that Kai was speaking to, um, as well as the... Um, the ability to, to create these things, the, the ability to realize that these are possible, that these should be possible, that, that they're desirable. Um, you know, the other aspect of this, when you're you're thinking about, you know, building these systems with a layer of intelligence, building these systems with a layer of understanding, um, it, it really gets to a lot of what I've seen in the, the analytics space. Um, you know, more recently, I've been doing a lot of work around uh, data analytics and helping people make decisions. And more and more consumers today, people who are sitting in front of business dashboards or whatnot, they say, don't just tell me what's happening. Tell me what I should do about it. Tell me what I have done about it in the past. Do the investigation for me. Prepare the results as much as possible. So I think there's still some caution around, you know, automatically going and looking up what did I do the last 300 times and crossing your fingers that it'll work out this time. Um, but there is an enormous appetite for um, for people who are in these decision making roles to see that kind of context, to have that kind of information summarized for them. Um, and AI is a way to automatically do that kind of analysis, automatically present that kind of information. So, so I, I do think there's a big appetite for this. Whether people are ready to run them in a, a totally automated fashion, I think depends a lot on the domain. Um, and, and on people's sort of appetite for uh, for exciting deployments. I knew it. I knew it. I, it. It's like, Richard, you're one of the rare unicorns out there that had as much exposure into stream processing as into AI. So I knew that you would have a good perspective on this. And I, I was going to ask the question of how does live data support AI? And I can see right. the idea of, um, you know, yeah. having a fresher opinion into or a fresher view into, into the, the features you need to train on. Yeah, I mean, there's a few different ways that this comes to play. So if you're looking at the sort of inside the building analytics, you know, feeding some decision maker, they expect up to date information and push based information makes sense. So seeing, you know, as something has changed, getting the alert, knowing what's going on. So that's that makes a lot of sense, that idea of up to date analytics, you know, up to date insight. On the other side, there's a lot of an appetite in the use of AI to be the uh, front end, the customer facing experience, like airlines uh, being a, a really good example where the people expect are, are exploring, developing, deploying, um, you know, chat bots and other sort of interactive agents uh, as part of airline customer support. Um, and that's wonderful, you know, if they, if they work properly. But one of the things that I, as a frequent consumer of airlines have gotten used to is if I'm talking to a human, they have a really good intuition for how up to date the information they're working with is. You know, I'll ask someone, you know, can you give me a seat on that flight, and they'll say, "Well, I see three seats, but let me go ahead and put it through. We'll see if I can get it done." You know, those seats they might be fan of inventory. There might be some other thing going on. There's often a lot of nuance when it comes to thinking about the state of the world, the state of the business. AI really struggles with some of that nuance, um, and a lot, and it struggles even more when it has to work with out of date data. So I think there's really a need when you put AI in those customer facing situations, uh, when you put AI in a position of having to make decisions, you really do need to feed it with the most up to date information in order to meet expectations. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I'd, I'd be curious just from, from either of you. So that kind of tells me how live data, how data in motion makes artificial intelligence better, stronger, faster, all around more accurate. I'd be curious to know, um, how does AI help live data? I mean, you gave the good example of 300 uh, times in the past is not necessarily good, but 300 well-selected times might be interesting. So I can see if AI is trained to recognize, like you, you're always able to sense and have an awareness of the market or whatever it is we're looking at, if it could say, yes, this is at the, the appropriate time. So maybe that's one thing, but I'd be curious to pick your brain on, on how AI can support live data. 
Well, I think one area that uh, I see being very important for a lot of these live data things is uh, data observability or, or say data quality analysis. Uh, whether that's like like a, a company I've done some work with is uh, is Metaplane, you know those kind of tooling that's just around monitoring and understanding the quality of the data, being able to drive a certain level of reliability is, is critical, um, and that usually combines not only stream processing types of approaches but also AI types of approaches to understanding you know when is th when have things uh, deviated from expectations or how have they deviated. So intelligence four and two about live metadata. That's an, that's an interesting thing. I like that. Sorry, Kai, go ahead. Yeah, and, and maybe think about it the other way around, because this is already a tough question, what you're discussing here. And I think Richard is doing all sort of green, right? And this take a more years for some of these questions to get down. The other way around, and this is something where I had a conference talk this morning, actually, um, data streaming can help AI. So it's turning the other way around, right? If you think about generative AI these days, and um, not just about a chatbot, but really also when you integrate transactional data, like for a booking or a payment or a rebooking of a flight, um, then you need the right prompt. Well, the right prompts means you need the right context. And of course, now we have vector database and so on. But in the end, um, data streaming platform can take the data with stream processing and put the right context into the prompt. And so um, we can see it in both directions of AI and data streaming and help each other out there. Quite right. So I might move on to the final slide and then I think uh, we'll try and take some Q&A in the last time that we have. Um, but I wanted to put this out there of, um, you know, we talked a lot about streaming intelligence and um, I'm kind of thinking, could this be ubiquitous, right? So can we take some of the things that we're seeing and move it wherever it needs to go, right? So you've got intelligence at the edge, you've got intelligence wherever we wanna put it. Um, I, I have my answers for this, but I'm wondering in the field, if we're starting to see people say, I love the idea of having um, live data and historical data to have, uh, you know, the, the pattern we showed earlier of correlation and instantaneous um, filtering, but are they starting to look at taking that and finding platforms that could move it wherever that intelligence and those decisions need to be made? I mean, I've definitely seen an appetite for these kind of edge deployments and edge platforms. I think there, there's constantly a tension about, you know, sort of what solution, which, which problem are you solving by creating this somewhat more sophisticated deployment? Um, whether, so I've seen cases where it's a latency, you know, issue where there's a desire for the systems at the edge to be able to react more quickly. I've seen situations where it's a, uh, a disconnected operation concern, obviously those, those come into play. Um, and I've seen system situations where it's a bandwidth or a backhaul uh, sort of concern where there's too much data. Um, and frequently those those three kinds of uh, situations, the, the latency, the disconnected operation, and the data volume, I see those most often with automated systems, with IoT types of systems, um, oil and gas being a, a common example, but also uh, more recently uh, monitoring grid scale uh, solar infrastructure um, or, or any of these sort of you know, complex systems that require, um, you know, a lot of a lot of analysis to be happening, where you're trying to manage resources, manage responses, uh, and those sorts of things. So I, I think there is, it is definitely possible. I think the, the really major question becomes, you know, which, which applications really demand that. Right. And if I'm operating a retail organization yeah. with a thousand stores, I don't know that I have the same problem that I do when I have 10,000 oil wells and they're all in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, but I don't know, Kai, you, you see a lot more of these things in practice. What, what sort of edge deployments are you looking at? I, I, I do. And, and and this is where I just want to add, it's really not just about appetite anymore, right? So this is really about real world deployments. And um, we have customers um, that really deploy at the edge. And this is not just um, the factories, but we are talking to the real there are thousands of stores because in these stores they have an industrial PC anyway, right? With at least eight gigabyte RAM, and mm -hmm. why only do batch in there with a with a database and an API? So, um, uh, a, a real world example is Royal Caribbean, right? So this is the edge at a at a ship where on ship they do location based services, they do recommendations. Like in Disney World, right? You cannot uh, even live there um, on vacation without your mobile app. And all this personalization, location-based services are going on at the edge because the internet is bad and it, it's expensive, right? And so this is definitely happening across industries and manufacturing in oil and gas, um, in retail. And we see this everywhere. 
And this is why also do we see the burnouts because stream processing is in real time is better than batch. But also now where people adopted data streaming and stream processing in the cloud, and they always will be first, like Richard said, right? If possible, do it in the cloud. But um, right. you go to the edge for a cost, for security, or for latency reasons. And um, therefore, um, in many cases, however, you need it still edge for advantage. Um, and with that, we see this a lot. And therefore, the good thing is, like, like the question about the Kafka protocol, what's better for a developer than using the same technology or API everywhere? And this mm -hmm. is why we have, as a, an example, a clear strategy to deploy everywhere. And this doesn't mean just all the cloud solutions, but this also means the data center, obviously, but also this means the edge, which in my definition is outside a data center. And even right. more interestingly, um, you can then decide if you deploy this in a mission critical way in a distributed system, like with three or four brokers, or you can even do a single node deployment at the edge of the edge, which for example, in, um, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the public sector, we have customers really now deploy on the soldier on a very small industrial PC with one single node where they do all the edge analytics while the soldier is walking on the field and yeah. then he synchronizes back to the command center which is still at the edge but a mission critical system and each center then replicates data to the cloud and so the other thing what you really shouldn't underestimate so, so for the audience right is um on the one side, um, you can deploy stream processing everywhere, but as important as that is then also replicating some of the data back to your control center, mm -hmm. which can be a command post, which can be on the cloud, whatever. And so when you think about stream processing, it's not just about deploying small at the edge or big in the cloud, but also replicating some of the data in real time in one of both directions. And this is in the end yeah. what we see at our customers, um, but it's definitely already much more than just appetite. Yeah, and kind of that that's exactly what we see too. A time plus, like we are kind of a single platform for doing a lot of this stuff. So it, exactly in the use case, Richard, you mentioned, I mean, I I know we we'd seen this in the past that in a former life and uh the exact same thing, right? Being able to run data center type uh, uh analytics at the edge because there's no internet connection, but you got to make decisions. Um we only have a couple minutes left. We did have a couple questions come through. So Kai, I will um ask you the question would you mind telling us a little bit about the plans confluent has for flink i know that's kind of a, a large topic in particular uh materialized views mm -hmm. um and along the kind of ideas of you know materializing a view and having that become a table view into a stream uh what do we have in terms of consistency right are we more consistent or internally consistent similar to a differential data flow like materialize and others I know there's not a lot of time, so maybe a yeah, little so, explanation there. Yeah, so, so the, the, the short answer is really that, um, first of all, for Flink, I mean, strategically invest in it. So um, we also do a decision over a year ago. So most of you will, in, in two years, they we will think about us, not just as the Kafka company, but in the same way about Flink company. Um, and we are heavily investing into that. Um, and in the same hybrid way, like we just discussed in the last slide about Edge, and we will deploy Flink everywhere and um, connect these systems and this is our key strategy and also to make it much easier for the end user and then obviously which use cases does flink and fit in right and all these discussions about consistency and materialized views um that's then what we will find out together with the customers what they need to do what they want to do and where they also need other technologies right and this is once again why also the clear message is um they're streaming, you are the data fabric to use the Gardner term, right? Um, but we are connecting all these events. They are flowing through the system in motion, but open APIs. And on the one side, you can call the Kafka protocol, you can connect with our REST APIs, or you can use, for example, the Confluent, uh, the Connect with Confluent program to connect to Time Plus or others to build materialized views in that application if it's the better fit with a technology. And um, what these technologies bring in next years and what content will also do, and that's what we will see over the next years. That's why um, part of this discussion is, of course, the future, which is a perfect a fit for stream processing then and seeing the future. Excellent. Well, we've kind of hit the end of our time. i am tell you what, an hour flew by like 10 minutes for me. Kai, Richard, it's always a great pleasure to talk to you. And I hope everybody enjoyed this webinar. Hopefully we can do another one soon. Thank you to everybody. And thank you guys awesome. so much. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Michael. Thanks a lot, everyone.